Hello, folks. Welcome to the Genuinely Interested Podcast. My name is Roy Bensvi, and this show is about me interviewing people who I'm genuinely interested in, uh, whether it's their life story, something that they do, some speciality that they've honed in on, you know, for, for their whole lives or, or whatnot. So I try to bring special and intriguing and interesting people on and have good conversations, try to get as much information from them as possible for your sake and my sake. I feel like I'm learning a little something every episode, so I thoroughly enjoy this. On this episode today, we have the master coffee aficionado, coffee truther, Asher Yaron. This guy is the end-all be-all when it comes to coffee. We spoke for about 80 minutes or so, and I learned so much about coffee, the types of coffee that you need to consume, the types you shouldn't consume, difference between freshly roasted and stuff that's been on the uh, shelf for who knows how long. And yeah, it was a very interesting conversation. I definitely left the conversation feeling a certain way about the coffee I consume, and I think I'm going to start looking into different options, fresher, uh, more organic. Yeah, it's one of those things where you kind of, I think we all consume on a daily basis, but we don't really give it too much thought. Uh, I feel like there's just sometimes there's too many things, right? If you're watching documentaries or reading the news or watching movies, like everything you consume or do, it seems like there's a better version of it out there. So you kind of have to pick and choose what you really get into. Is it the type of baby food that you feed your kids? Is it uh, organic versus not organic? Is it plastics? Is it vegan versus non-vegan? Is it coffee? Is it... It's, just, it's endless. The list is endless. Everything in the supermarket that you consume on a daily basis is either hurting you or helping you. And we kind of have to pick and choose which ones we want to consume. So coffee is just so ubiquitous. It's part of human culture. It's part of societies. It's part of tradition. And sometimes it's even part of certain ceremonies in certain cultures. So it's an integral part of society. And we just don't put enough emphasis on what type of coffee we're consuming. So I was really happy to have Usher on. He laid a lot of the facts out. I think a lot of it is really, it's it's kind of common sense. I don't think it's, um, it's not too far out there. It's not some fringe opinion. I think yeah, if you had a conversation with anyone who loves coffee and give him Usher's thoughts and philosophy, I think he would agree that that makes the most sense. So, you know, I was happy to have him on and really have him lay out how he sees the future of coffee, as he calls it, the fourth wave. Now, if you want to read more about it after listening to the podcast, check out his book. Uh, I'm going to put a link in the show notes where you can get it for free as a listener of this podcast. You're going to have a link with a code and you should be able to get it through there. So we're going to link that up. And yeah, if you're into coffee, which most people are, this is a great episode to listen to, to learn from, and, you know, take from it what you will. But it's always good to listen and educate yourself on the different type of things that we consume, especially coffee, which is a daily consumption for the majority of humankind. So without further ado, here is Asher Yaron. The Genuinely Interested Podcast. Hey, Asher, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? Good, good. Thanks uh, for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Good to be here. Yeah, man. So yeah, I've, uh, you know, I wanted to have you on for 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 uh, for a while because uh, I remember watching your um, TED talk back in the day, and um, coffee is one of those things that I think it's it's unanimous that overwhelming majority of the population loves coffee. Like, there's not a lot of people that hate coffee or, or don't consume coffee. 
And uh, you're kind of at the top of the heap. You're a self-proclaimed coffee freak. Um, can you kind of walk us through that process and, and how you got to be, you know, the the coffee truther? Yeah. So, um, uh, first of all, I'll say uh, about the prevalence of coffee being such a widely used substance. It's the most widely used um, psychoactive substance in the world. And what I'm going to talk about today is going to go back to the original uses of that substance to get the most out of it, rather today when it's been completely stripped of a lot of its vital elements and become a caffeinated beverage. And my journey started as a coffee enthusiast back in the early uh, 2000s. I was moving to Connecticut from Los Angeles and would drink a coffee every morning. I'd go to Starbucks and go to one of the big uh, places and knew that I was moving to a place on 20 acres and there's not going to be any kind of coffee shop nearby. I'm going to have to learn how to make my own coffee. So I started to uh, do some research and observe that everyone was focused on the barista, the role of the barista, mm -hmm. and how important it is to know how to make good coffee with really good equipment, espresso machines, fancy grinders, very expensive kind of equipment. And I thought, like many other people, that was a way to have better coffee. So I bought a, a, a Italian-made espresso machine with a grinder, and I started to practice at home. Now, at the time, what I was practicing with was coffee I was buying in bulk from Costco, from one of the, the big stores, five-pound bag, already roasted, and labels like Starbucks, Green Mountain, um, you know, the, the regular assortment of large companies making this coffee that would be available at Costco. And it all tasted about the same to me. I never really got much of a, a difference out of uh, each one of them. They're all pretty much the same. And I practiced my skills as a barista, and it really wasn't improving that much. I got a little bit better at working the machines, but it still seemed something was missing. So fast forward uh, a couple years, so I'm still not really satisfied with my coffee experience and my coffee making ability and I had a property that I was renting out subletting uh, to some people and they knew I loved coffee and they brought me a baggie a plastic baggie with roasted coffee beans in it and they said try this we roasted it yesterday in our hot air popcorn pop and when they said that I really didn't know what they were talking about but uh, so okay yeah, I'll try it. It's kind of weird because it didn't have that slick label. The packaging wasn't great, right? <laughs> so yeah. I went home. I just put it in the cupboard. And the next morning when I went to make my coffee, I was out of my Starbucks coffee. I didn't have any more. So I decided, oh, I remembered I got this baggie of this coffee from my new tenants. And I tried it and I made my coffee. And as soon as I took my first sip of that coffee, I knew instantly that this was something completely different than anything I had ever had. I started to really seriously get high from it. It was so potent, so alive, um, that I had to sit down. My I mean, knees were buckling. I mean, it was really, it was that powerful. Now, it was more powerful because I had no expectation of being different. So I was really could tell the difference between this coffee and every other coffee experience I ever had. And I realized that the key to this was it was fresh roasted coffee. They roasted it yesterday. So I started to ask myself, well, how old is the coffee that's on the store shelves? And started to look at it. And usually those coffee companies put a best buy date that's two years ahead of when they roasted it. So you can usually deduce that the coffee's a year old. Now, Costco, usually it would be near that expiration date because that's why it's on sale, right? And that vacuum bag 
uh, prevents oxidation, but it doesn't prevent the deterioration of the coffee right after it's roasted. So I knew right away this was exactly what I was looking for. I couldn't believe it. And I started to look for ways I could roast my own coffee. And I ended up getting a one-pound drum and a chicken rotisserie motor and used my outdoor grill to roast the coffee. And it did not a great job. It was very uneven, the roast, some light, some dark. But still, when I tasted it right away, still the best coffee I ever had because it was fresh roasted. So I knew that was a key. I knew that this idea behind roasters being like rocket scientists and knowing exactly how to roast this certain bean was BS. You know, it didn't make any difference. The biggest difference was it was fresh roasted and you're having it right away. So it's kind of like having a fresh baked bread out of the oven. But not only is that bread tasting better, that bread has chemical ingredients and substances that affect the brain. That's what the coffee difference is. There's substances in there that affect the brain and help us as humans focus, concentrate, and create because that's how we create. So I started a small coffee business, roasting my own coffee because I was sharing it with my friends. They could not believe the difference. They had the same reaction that I had. Now, this is 15 years ago, and no one was really talking about uh, fresh roasted coffee back then. I was really one of the the first people in, in my area anyway, and I was sharing and talking to other people. The coffee professionals didn't realize what I was talking about. They thought they thought it was crazy. They they were completely uh, brainwashed into the idea that coffee after roasting must rest. It must sit. It must allow these gases that are created during the roasting process to escape. Now, what happens when coffee's roasted from a green bean to, to roasted coffee? There's over a thousand chemical substances created. And caffeine is only one of those substances, yet it's the only one that people talk about. Because what happens is all those other substances, 999 of them, are considered volatiles. And they don't hang around that long. They leave the coffee bean as gases, as aromas, as other things. And within a week, it's gone. And that coffee is the same as any other coffee you buy off the shelf. It's a caffeinated beverage. It's lost all of its essence, all of its magic, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, I, I started roasting at home, had a small business, and then I moved to Bali because I wanted to be closer to the cherry to the cup experience where I knew they grew coffee in Bali and I could get it. I could. Uh, have control over the harvesting of that coffee, the roasting, and the grinding and brewing of the coffee. So literally, from the cherry to the cup, uh, make the best coffee possible by being involved in that entire process. And that's what I did in 2010. I moved to uh, Bali, Indonesia, and I set up a roastery there, and I started to serve my coffee. And at that time, no one was serving fresh roasted coffee like this because the Balinese style of making the coffee was to roast huge quantities at a time, grind it to a powder, put it in plastic bag, and then bring it to the market. So their coffee is just hot water mixing with the very, very finely ground coffee, almost like an instant beverage. That's how they made their coffee. And every time I go to Bali, as though we had a business that took us there several times a year, I would start drinking tea because the coffee was really so bad. And that's because it was old roasted and ground, so it was already oxidized. It was completely stripped of any uh, good taste, any of these other chemical substances I'm talking about. And it was literally just a caffeinated beverage with the easiest method of being able to make it is just pour it with hot water and mix it in a glass. And that's what they, they've done. And a lot of that's economical. They don't have the machinery to do it the way that I'm talking about. So when I went there and brought my methods and people started to try the coffee, they could not believe it. Could not believe it. So I, I very quickly was able to make a name for myself as the best coffee anywhere and uh, opened some cafes, had a Balinese partner, 
and he was a coffee farmer. So we were literally doing from the cherry to the cup and, and keeping track of that entire process. So uh, at that time also, I had the idea that I just wanted to share this coffee with everybody. So I would uh, sell my commercial roaster to cafes and they can make fresh roasted coffee for their customers. And I was able to make a commercial coffee roaster, an eight kilo, 16 pound commercial coffee roaster that I sold for 3,000 US dollars. It was a tenth of the price of the big commercial uh, coffee machine. And I found that very few people wanted to buy it because all these cafe, cafe owners had no idea about fresh roasted coffee. They, because no one's talking about it. The big coffee companies, it's like mainstream media, they're not talking about the truth. It's like the big coffee companies, they're not talking about uh, the truth of, of what this coffee is. And uh, I was disappointed because I couldn't believe that all these coffee professionals, people were cafe owners, were settling for coffee that was inferior to the coffee that they could have had. And around this time, this is uh, 2012, I was asked to do a TED Talk, TEDx Talk about coffee. And I did that in the summer of 2012. And that has uh, almost 2 million views right now, and it's really driven a lot of uh, the, the business that I've created uh, since then. The name of the talk is What You Didn't Know About Coffee, Asheri Aron at TEDx Ubud Bali. And that, doing the research for that talk uh, gave me a lot more understanding about coffee and where it's come from and where it started when it was first discovered and what's happened to it. And what I realized was that coffee was the very first performance-enhancing drug. The very first people to use the coffee were the monks, were the Sufis, the mystics, the Islam mystics. And they were using it to stay awake at night, to meditate, to do their whirling dervishes. They were getting high from it. And when I found this out, I was started to think about what's happened since then and how long did this last? So if you look through a history of coffee, it's gone from Ethiopia, where it was discovered, and using it by the monks to this beverage that started to spread throughout the world. And uh, today, it's so common because the big coffee companies, about 150 years ago, found ways to commoditize it, to roast in huge batches, to package it, to ship it internationally. So they really took this idea of coffee being this magic substance and through their processes of getting it to as many people as possible, they created it as a caffeinated beverage. And that's pretty much what 99% of the coffee today is. Anything you buy in the store is just a caffeinated beverage. So when, when you yeah. say, when you say it's, it's night and day, right? Like the, 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 the coffee that you roast and you drink, let's say within a week and uh, coffee that's, you know, put on the shelf for a year or so, uh, which, uh, you know, everyone loves. They go to coffee shops, they buy them in supermarkets and then people love that coffee. How different is, it? like, what are we talking about? What are people missing? Like, would anybody that tastes these two coffees you put in a blind taste test? Everyone would taste the difference, or is this just for the, uh, the purists uh, among us? Absolutely everybody. Everybody. Because there's, there's, there's so many uh, um, ways that we can tell with our senses how much better it is. The first is the smell. When you take fresh roasted coffee, and, and I, when I talk about fresh roasted coffee, I'm talking about coffee roasted within 24 hours mm -hmm. because it deteriorates very rapidly. after. Just 24 hours, 40% of the gases created during the coffee has already left the coffee bean, almost half. And, and those are the good, good chemical substances that I'm saying 
uh, is the performance enhancing drug part of being able to focus our uh, brains and concentration. So I'm talking about roasting coffee and then using it right away, which is also called the Ethiopian coffee ceremony. And they've been doing this for over 1,000 years in the exact same way. I'm not creating anything new. I'm just going, hey, I like what those indigenous people are doing. Look how they're getting high off this stuff. I want that experience. How can I duplicate it? And the cool thing is today we have all this equipment that I can duplicate their experience, which takes three or four hours. I could do it in my kitchen in 10 to 15 minutes. And that is the technological advancement. We can have the same coffee, but in a very short time with affordable equipment and, and doing it ourselves. And so it is a world of difference. The difference is, first of all, you smell it. You get all these other aromas in the coffee. And they say coffee has four times the amount of taste as wine, as red wine. Four times. It's wow. a huge amount. Yeah. But when you grind dead coffee, you don't get any of that. You're missing all of it. When you have fresh roasted coffee, you grind it, you smell it. The aroma is absolutely through the roof. And then when you make the coffee, However, you choose to do the brewing process. I prefer espresso because it's the most intense. It's the best, in my opinion. Uh, but however you do it, um, you notice that there's a bloom. There's a head. There's a crema. And any way you're brewing it, there's an aliveness to it. These are the chemicals. These are the chemicals that are still active in it. So then when you taste it, it doesn't taste like bitter coffee. In fact, it's usually not bitter at all. It, it has some sweet, some sour, bitter, all mixed in together. So it's this totally balanced taste. What we're used to drinking is something that tastes flat and then has a bitter aftertaste. And we've been trained, we've been brainwashed into thinking that that is strong coffee, the Starbucks way, right? Roast the hell out of it so it's pretty much charcoal and then... Uh, make drinks out of it that is really a flat and bitterness, so you need to add a lot of sugar and additives. And they do that because then their coffee can taste the same anywhere in the world. They have to roast out the geographic differences of each coffee bean. So when you taste the coffee that way, it's a completely different taste. It doesn't taste like coffee like anyone's used to. And you feel so inspired you you have energy now the energy is not from the caffeine the energy is from areas of the brain that are affected and it feels to me and i want to go into a lab and study this and i will eventually but it feels to me like this is hitting areas of the brain that have to do with happiness that have to do with inspiration that have to do with creativity and that is the performance enhancing drug aspect that i'm talking about and when you're drinking a flat bitter coffee it's weaker because it doesn't have those elements and the taste is just left you with bitterness that we equate with strength but it's actually the opposite so, so you're saying that the sweeter the coffee the stronger the coffee the the weaker the coffee the more bitter it is which is it's the exact opposite of what i've exactly. thought coffee was <laughs> my whole life that's right but who put those ideas in your head? The big coffee companies. They want you to think that the more bitter, whoa, that's strong coffee. They want you to think that because their process is using dead coffee that's only bitter, that doesn't have these other elements. So it's like everything else. You know, how have we been programmed? And that's why I talk about coffee truth and being a coffee truther because this is very similar to what people are realizing today, how by through marketing and through planting ideas in our heads, we have ideas about things that aren't necessarily true, but they help the system, right? They support the system. They support politicians. They support, you know, the leaders, stuff like that. So uh, I think when you start to question this stuff, you go, wait a minute. Okay. You start doing it yourself, and then you get closer to the process, and eventually you go, <laughs> okay, I found the truth. I think these people 
are believing something that's that's not the truth. And that is one of the one of those things is that bitter coffee is strong coffee. So, for example, when you have Nespresso, right, and they have those uh, like levels, right? Like, I don't know what the, I think it's like a 10 or 11, which is, I believe, the strongest. And those are like super, uh, super strong, super bitter. And then you have the ones that are like, I don't know, a four or a five. And they'll be like more mocha, vanilla, those types of more sweetish flavors. And it's the complete opposite, right? Well, so so this is how the industry has set it up and set up barista competitions and created something. Now, this is the SCAA I'm talking about, the Specialty Coffee Association of America. And they've created a wheel. And all this wheel is a flavor wheel. It's a taste wheel, right? And it has all these different elements, all these different tastes. And what they train people to do is to identify those tastes that is in the coffee. OK, so the, my method would be not a tasting wheel, but a feeling wheel. So I went on that wheel. Oh, I had inspiring thoughts. Oh, I feel so happy today. Oh, I have energy and able to focus and, and create from the thoughts that I'm thinking. That's the PED aspect of the coffee, whereas they are focusing on the taste aspect only. The problem with focusing on the taste aspect only is you have to let the coffee deteriorate to a point where you can identify those tastes. Because when you have just fresh roasted coffee, there's so many tastes going on, your tongue cannot distinguish between blackberry and caramel, all those different tastes that they list. So that's why they say, you must leave the coffee, let it sit, and it develops these tastes. Nothing develops, it just deteriorates. But it deteriorates to the point where the human taste bud can then identify and separate out these tastes. So they got everyone focused on what does that coffee taste like and where it's from and notes of this and that, you know, kind of like wines. And I'm going, hey, <laughs> I don't care too much about that. And when it's really fresh, it tastes the best to me. I mean, this is incredible. I don't need to say, I taste blackberry, I taste strawberry, I taste jasmine. Now, I don't need that. I want to feel high from it. And that's what I get when I'm using this fresh roasted coffee. So how often do, let's say, third wave coffee shops, you know, that's uh, quote unquote, the most elite, uh, the best boutique, nicest coffee shops that that we have. And we think, you know, this is the best coffee in it. Again, I know very little about coffee. I like consuming it, but I don't know the ins and outs. How often do they roast their coffee, would you say? Or is there some sort of a, you know, just once a week, once a month? How, how often? Yeah, usually you hit it right on the head. Usually it's like once a week because they have these huge machines, which incidentally cost tens of thousands of dollars. And they have, they've hired a professional roaster who maybe comes in just once a week to roast. And he'll roast maybe all day long, like for eight hours. And he'll roast enough to last, you know, for their entire week of uh, of what they're using for their cafes and also to ship it out, right? And I've talked to these people, and they they do that because, well, the coffee has to rest anyway. So their belief is that they take their fresh roasted coffee, they vacuum pack it, and that coffee reaches the customer in as good a state as when it was freshly roasted. And it's not because that packaging has a one-way valve, and that one-way valve is here to let the gases, the, the PED substances that I'm talking about, escape from that bag without the bag blowing up, right? So they put mm -hmm. the, the fresh roast coffee in the bag, all those gases escape, it's still vacuum sealed, so it hasn't oxidized, oxygen hasn't coming into the porous beans and broken them down further, but as soon as you open that package, the oxidation process starts immediately. Whereas if you fresh roast coffee, you have about seven days for those gases to escape before oxidation can even happen. So it doesn't have to be in a, in a vacuum seal bag. And like I said, 40% of those gases within 24 hours and then diminishing amounts over those next seven days. But in my estimation, it takes about seven days for that coffee to completely be breathing out all of the gases created during roasting before oxygen can come in and 
uh, deteriorated further. So usually the third wave coffee shops, they don't understand how it's better to have fresh roasted coffee. So they've been roasting like once a week. And I'm thinking, okay, what comes next to this third wave? The third wave was able to increase the – Starbucks was the second wave. And the third wave was able to increase the awareness about coffee to different origins of where coffee is grown, what happens during the process, more fresh roasted, but not the ultimate fresh roasted. And that's where I came up with the idea of the fourth wave of coffee because it's a, a fast-growing segment of the population that roast their own coffee at home. I'm on several uh, chat groups uh, about this online, and it's fascinating because once people start roasting their own coffee at home, they'll never go back to buying coffee in the store. Never, ever. They only use their own roasted coffee. And so I see the passion, and I see the um, you know where this thing is headed. So I said, coffee, the fourth wave of fresh roasting revolution. And the idea is for everyone to roast their own coffee in their home as often as every single day. And I try to roast. I'm the only coffee. I live alone, so I'm the only coffee drinker in my home. So when I roast 120 grams, it lasts me for two days. Um, but if uh, I could, I would roast every single day because then I'm getting the absolute uh, best quality coffee. And I do it with a machine that I developed called the Power Roaster. And it roasts 120 grams in about six minutes. And then I have a, a grinder and a brewer. And so my whole process takes about 10, 12 minutes every morning to roast, grind, brew. Mm -hmm. And the machine is actually very affordable. It's only a few hundred dollars. So, Is that what you had the Kickstarter for? Yes, exactly, exactly. So that when I buy green coffee and I'm roasting it and doing this process myself, I am saving hundreds of dollars from going to the nearby Starbucks and buying a coffee every day. I mean, it's really that much. So, so this whole process can be done. People can have better coffee, more inspired coffee, a much better coffee experience, and save money at the same time. It's really it's the perfect opportunity to hit on every uh, level like that. Yeah, maybe you could tell people a little bit about the Kickstarter. I just recently found it. I know you hit your goal. Uh, I believe it was fifty thousand, and I saw that you, you know, you managed to do more than that. Maybe you know, explain that to people. Yeah, so uh, we started a Kickstarter campaign in two thousand eighteen, and this is a, a guy, a partner, the guy that I'm I, I partnered with. And I started roasting in a hot air popcorn popper, and I had this at home, and a lot of people start there. And it's really useful because they're really cheap, and they do a really pretty good job. You have to make some modifications with each machine, but they do a pretty good job of uh, of fresh roasting the right amount. Um, the problem with it is there's no chaff collection, so it's very messy. It's like if you're, if you're living outside, you got to do it outside because it's make a total mess with the chaff, which is the skins between the coffee beans that that come out and fly around during the roasting process. So uh, I, I hooked up with this guy. His name is Raymond Lay, and he's an IT tech guy in Singapore. I was living in uh, Bali at the time, and Ray was interested in my process. He had seen my TEDx talk also, and we started talking, and I shared with him, I sold him, actually, the hot air popcorn popper that I was using with the modifications I was making and encouraged him to start roasting on his own. And he took to it so quickly and was so excited about it that he started to go to flea markets in Singapore on the weekend. And he started to collect these hot air popcorn pots. And he started to take them apart. And he started to take a look at how they're made. He's more of a technical guy like that. And, and we were continuing talking. And we decided, let's develop our own machine based on this, uh, the basic foundation of what the popcorn how their popcorn popper is, because it works pretty good. seems like a good place to start. Then we can add this, and then we can design it this way, call it this, you know, make some changes, which we've done. But it's taken us, been working on it for like five years. And uh, only two years ago, we launched a Kickstarter campaign. And the idea behind the roaster is to make it as simple as possible. Other people are making home roasters, and they're putting all these bells and dials and whistles, these computer hookups, 
something called a roast profile, and it's all really BS. I mean, uh, it's all stuff that adds a lot of cost to these roasters and that really, in the end, doesn't benefit whatsoever. The main thing is using the coffee immediately after roasting. That's the most important thing. So we came up with this machine that essentially just has an on-off switch. So what you do is you put the coffee in, turn the machine on. When it matches the color, which you can clearly see through the machine, turn the machine off, you're ready. And this next prototype that we're making has a cooling cycle. So after roasting, you flip the switch, it starts cooling, turns the uh, heat off, and the fan keeps going. In two minutes, coffee's ready to grind and brew. So uh, that's where we're heading. And we're currently uh, making our latest uh, prototype in West Java and want to launch another Kickstarter campaign when that's uh, completed in a few months' time. But uh, it's helped us. The, the Kickstarter was more like a proof of concept kind of thing. And, and it's helped yeah. us get a lot of feedback on the machine, what, what uh, additions, what corrections we need to make. And that's where we are right now making those additions and corrections. And not only that, but we're also working on a grinder and a manual espresso machine. So if you take a all look. All in so, one. Uh, not all in one. It's impossible to have, one, and people have tried it, but it's impossible to have one machine where you push a button and it roast grinds and brews. Technology's not there yet. Can't do it. And doesn't okay. doesn't seem like a good pursuit to try to make something like that. It costs way too much money. Uh, to try to do that. So instead, we want to create with our company. And so I hooked up with Ray. And we started a company called Pot Popi, which is literally Mr. Coffee. And we're based in Singapore. And we're designing equipment, coffee equipment to use for the home. And also want to get into uh, using it industrially, commercially as well. But, but for the time being, for the home, roast grind brew. So we have the roaster already. The grinder we're talking about and going to be working on a prototype pretty soon. And the manual espresso machine we're talking about and have been talking about for a couple of years now because we both agree that espresso is the highest form of coffee. And you can tell the most difference with espresso when it, the coffee is fresh roasted because it's the most concentrated form of coffee. So because of that, Whoa, you really feel the power of it. You really feel the uh, effect of it. Now, if you take a look at an espresso machine, first of all, they're extremely expensive. You can get home cheap models that don't do a good job. You can get something commercial with a big boiler that does do a great job. But that is extremely expensive. And if you look at the machine and take it down, break it down, and see what it does, it really does two things. It Boils water and it creates pressure. That's the only thing that an espresso machine does. The pressure and the boiling water is created and helpful when you put it in the porta filter and it extracts a very intense cup of coffee. And then you also have a milk steamer. You have this way of steaming milk to add it to the coffee. So if we take a look at those two elements and break them down and separate them, well, you know, boiling water is so cheap. I mean, if you go in the store for 15, 20 bucks, you can buy a pitcher of water with that base that plugs into the wall and it boils water really effectively, right? And yep. the other way that now people are making separate milk steamers, which essentially all it is is a pot with boiling water and a valve on it that you can turn that creates the pressure and and steam the milk. So we're separating this stuff out, and the pressure we're creating is with a levered machine that's manually pressed down into the ground coffee, and that presses the shot. And you don't need electricity for that. The only electricity you need is to heat up the water and to uh, heat up the milk steamer if you want the milk steamer. So we can create an incredible machine for several hundred dollars that works as good as any commercial machine. And that's what we're in the process of making right now with our with our prototype. So really excited too. 
and actually with this COVID-19 thing, everyone is in the home now. People are going to want to make good yeah, coffee. Yeah. I think a yeah. lot of a lot of people are going to start working from their home and they want to make their own coffee. They want to make great coffee. Now, I don't just want to sell the product and get it out there. What I want to do is to uh, recruit ambassadors to the company, train them as to knowing how to use all this equipment and why, and then make them mobile and be able to go uh, to and do house calls. Because I think it's very important to show people how to do this. It's a re-education. It's, if people are going to search online to try to find this stuff, they won't find it. They're going to find this... Um, you know, mainstream coffee kind of ideas about coffee and they'll get confused. So what I want to do is have people that can go to the home that can be experts and say, okay, this is how you have the best coffee, roast, grind, brew. It's all based on that process and be able to use the equipment. If people already have some equipment, so maybe they already have a good grinder and a, a brewer and they're satisfied with that. So they just need the roaster. So we can just add things in the process. And in addition to that, we can sell the green coffee. Because I can get green coffee anywhere in the world and repackage it into smaller quantities and sell that with my machine. So that is pretty much the vision I have of uh, where where I, I want to uh, uh, expand. I want to have a fleet of ambassadors that love coffee and that are into this process and that are creating like their own franchises within our company and teaching people how to make the best coffee. My question was, is there a trend towards, you know, freshly roasted coffee? Is there more uh, demand, more online searches? Are you just seeing, you know, are you seeing this trend going in that direction? Yes, absolutely. Within the last several years, it's been a huge movement towards this idea of fresh roasted coffee because people are trying it for themselves and sharing it with their friends and family. And when an idea is that good and people realize it, boom, it catches on very fast. So an example of this is the TED Talk I gave in 2012. Now, mm -hmm. 15 years ago, uh, when I was first doing the coffee, no one was talking about this stuff. I was alone for a long time, for many years, and it had me questioning my conclusion. So I went back and tested Year after year, tested, tested, tested every day. And I worked with two sommeliers, wine tasters, who had very good palates. And we came up with the same conclusion every time. And we're doing blind taste tests. That the closer it was to roasting, the more potent, the more, the more fresh, the more alive it, it felt, the better, the better that it was. So it convinced me that I was onto something here, right? Um, but in 2012, when I gave my TED talk, after the first year, I only had 15,000 views. After the second year, 45,000. After the third year, 85,000. And it just kept building, you know? So today, almost 2 million views because people were realizing how uh, important this information was and how it was so counter to what is uh, currently thought and what is currently advertised in the coffee business. So there's been a big movement, but still this market is in its infancy really just beginning. And there are still a lot of people who do home roast who still talk about um, letting the coffee rest and when do you use the coffee after roasting because they've been trained to believe that you have to let the coffee rest. And more and more people over the last two years have been saying, like I've been saying, don't let it rest, use it right away. It's much better. Yeah. And slowly people are, are coming to that realization. But like I said, it's a re-education. It's like it's saying people something completely opposite to what everybody was taught, what everybody thinks. Doesn't mean it's wrong, but it's counter to it. And uh, in my opinion, there's opportunity there because there's so many people that have yet to really understand uh, this uh, this aspect of coffee. But as soon as they do, I think it's 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 going to continue to grow steadily, and then it'll reach a point where um, it will just it will just go viral. It will be that powerful, I think. So as far as, you know, coffee does have 
and then this is where where I wonder what the difference is. Yeah, you know, when you drink coffee, a lot of people, I don't know what the number, I think I saw someone's around 30% of people, they consume coffee, right? They have to go to the to the bathroom right away. There's some people that have stomach issues with it. And I, you know, there's a few side effects that, that bad side effects, you know, that, that some people um, experience when, when they drink certain types of coffee. Would freshly roasted coffee completely or somewhat eliminate some of those things? Uh, it, 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 some of those things are not because of the fresh roasting of coffee. It's because of the type of coffee, like you had just mentioned. So basically, there are two types of coffee. There's coffee mm-hmm. that's called Robusta, and there's coffee that's called Arabica. And these are the two main, there are two other types of coffee, um, Liberica and Excelsa, but the, they're a lot less common. So let's not talk about that. Let's talk about okay. Robusta and Arabica. Now, Arabica is a highly prized coffee. It's two to three times the price of Robusta. It's harder to grow because it must be a thousand meters or above in elevation to grow. It has lower yields, uh, but at the same time, it uh, has much, many more uh, flavors. It's susceptible to something called a leaf rust disease, which tends to hit the Arabica crop every 20, 10, 20, 30 years or so. You can wipe and to wipe it out. That's the risk that farmers take of this leaf rust disease. Then you have Robusta, and Robusta does not need to elevation to grow. Uh, Robusta is resistant to the leaf rust disease. It does not get it. It has higher yields. But the main difference between the two is Robusta has twice the caffeine as the Arabica. Twice mm. the caffeine. Now, I believe that, that that highly caffeinated Robusta coffee is overload the human nervous system. I thought I used to be sensitive to coffee. Because when I drink it, I get heart palpitations, I get some jitters. That was because I was drinking Robusta, not Arabica. When I drink 100% Arabica, I don't get any of those effects. Okay? So the Robusta also has the effect of uh, feeling a burning sensation in the throat and also more of an aggressive effect on the uh, digestive system. So Arabica, to me, is the perfect storm of all these chemical ingredients and elements, whereas Robusta is a highly caffeinated beverage and and puts you over the top as far as uh, feeling wired and scattered. So it's the opposite effect of a focused, steady buzz that the Arabica gives you, whereas the Robusta is more of an unfocused, uh, jittery, paranoid uh, kind of bug. So that's the big difference between the two. Now, if you take old Robusta and old Arabica, right, the old Robusta is just going to give you that high caffeine. You might as well drink the monster drink or something. Um, And the (laughs) Arabica at least will give you a lesser caffeine, uh, but not all those other elements. So when you have a coffee with all these substances, and you're talking about having it, Fresh roasted, that's when you get the benefit of everything. And the Arabica is the one that uh, creates the the best buzz, hands down. And so I recommend people only use 100% Arabica. And if they think they can't drink coffee because they're sensitive to caffeine, I say try 100% Arabica. Because I believe, and I've helped a lot of people who like coffee but think they can't drink it because they're sensitive to caffeine, they have not understood that they were drinking Robusta coffee, not Arabica coffee. You have to be very careful. The package has to say 100% Arabica. If it says Arabica, it could be half Arabica, half Robusta. And what about the other two that you mentioned? Are those harder to find? Yes, they are harder to find. They're only growing. So there's only four countries in the world that grows all four types, which is the Robusta, Arabica, Liberica, and Excelsa. One of those countries is the Philippines. And uh, I, I go to the Philippines quite often. Um, and I'm starting a, uh, one of our uh, coffee businesses in the, in the Philippines uh, right now, actually. Um, and I want to discover and explore more of the native coffee. Because a lot of these countries, 
have coffees that grow naturally, that are native coffees, that are different from yeah. these strains, these four strains. And I think they're going to have different chemical content. Every coffee is going to be a little bit different. So that's the kind of thing that I want to study and then and then be able to put on the packaging of green coffee and sell the green coffee and allow people to um, uh, to roast it themselves to get that uh, the best benefit. So the Excelsa and the Liberica is not considered as high a quality as the Arabica. They're considered somewhere between the Robusta and the Arabica as far as taste and effect, as far as quality of the coffee. But I don't have enough experience. I really want to explore more with uh, the Liberica and Excelsa. And the nice thing is in the Philippines, I have access to that. But there's not many places yeah. in the world that, that have access to that. Like if you take a place like Vietnam, Vietnam is one of the largest coffee producers in the world. I think maybe second or third largest behind Brazil and Colombia. And they grow 70% of the world's robusta supply. 70%. Huge amount of robusta. It's very hard to get Arabica there. Mm -hmm. And the people who are there selling this coffee to very cheaply are the canned coffee companies. Folgers, Maxwell House, Nescafe, those kind of companies. Because they're selling really cheap and bulk in a higher uh, caffeinated content coffee. Also, the older the coffee gets, it starts to lose that caffeine a little bit. So a lot of those instant coffee companies, they have to use Robusta to get the amount of caffeine in their cup. Because otherwise, if they used Arabica, uh, because the coffee deteriorates so much over time, that there wouldn't be that much caffeine left. So, so they use quite a bit of so earlier you mentioned um coffee as a ped and i know i, I think i believe this is in your book but uh, can you kind of elaborate a, about coffee as the original ped i know now a lot of companies and you know athletes uh, they use caffeine or, or beets or different things before a workout and then there's certain things that you use after a workout like uh not mct but um I'm blanking on it, but regardless, caffeine is is used today as kind of a pre workout um, drink or food or or whatever. Um, but you're saying this has been going on for centuries. Well, the, so here's here's the difference. Uh, yeah, uh, um, you know, over a thousand years, I mean, coffee was first used as a performance enhancing drug. Now they didn't have. Uh, Sport competitions they didn't have basketball, baseball. They were using it for what were they using it for? How was it performance enhancing? Well, the people who were fresh roasting it and using it and discovered it were the monks, were the Sufis, were the mystics, and what they were doing every night is meditating at night, dancing, getting into this state of consciousness that was connecting to the divine. That was their performance enhancing experience, and they used coffee in order to assist them to reach that experience, okay? Because what coffee does, not just caffeine, but coffee as the whole um, uh, chemical package, it, it creates an awareness, a focus, an ability to concentrate in the brain that is really very powerful because ultimately we create with our thoughts. And being able to stimulate and affect the brain in order to have specific thoughts of what we want to create is enhancing and it's very helpful. And what has happened is today, if something just becomes a caffeine boost, that's just about energy. You're talking about something that's going to affect the adrenal glands, get your adrenaline pumping, and you'll be ready for an event. The, the bottom side of that is once that those adrenal glands, if they get overused like that, then uh, they become weaker. You become susceptible. Uh, your immune system becomes more susceptible uh, to diseases and things. So uh, it, it's important to keep the caffeine level as low as possible, but within this overall picture of all these substances in order to get 
you know, the most bang for your buck, let's say, or the, the most the most beneficial effect. That is done with fresh roasting Arabica coffee. What that's become, people never experience that. They just think coffee, caffeine, coffee, caffeine, coffee, caffeine. Those are the only two things they relate it to. Because it's the only drug that's ever talked about as as coffee that's having. And it's not. But why is that? Because the big coffee companies, they don't want to pay for studies showing that there's thousand chemicals in there. Some of these chemicals uh, help the brain focus in certain ways. They don't want people to know that because their coffee doesn't have it. And what I'm saying is, let's drink the coffee that has those effects because then we're enhancing everything about our experience uh, without the downside of uh, weakening our adrenal gland. And, and just using the caffeine. So uh, when people just talk about coffee, instantly we think they're referring to caffeine as far as energy. And I'm saying there's so much more. And that's why I, I know I'm going to have to pay to go into a lab to break down all these elements, to know exactly what's in what coffee and what's in what coffee, what percentages and what varieties of coffee. It's a huge Huge amount of studies that need to be uh, looked at for this. But pretty much what I'm talking about is what most people have never experienced before. And I'm just saying, just experience it. You know, I don't care what kind of equipment you use in order to do it. But fresh roast your coffee, grind and brew, and just try it that way. Because once you do, you'll be amazed at the difference. So I know now coffee is obviously ubiquitous. And you're saying, you know, about a thousand years ago, it was kind of like the original LSD, you know, monks were using it in prayer and all these different things. But at, at what point throughout human civilization did kind of coffee get its real boom to to be what it is today? Uh, so so that pretty much happened in the uh, mid-1800s. In the mid-1800s, the first commercial coffee roasters were invented. And these were designed to roast huge quantities of coffee at the same time. Before that time, people used to roast their own coffee at home. They had these little, these uh, little uh, uh, drums. They would put some coffee in, and they would turn by hand over an open flame, and that's how they would roast their coffee. Most people did it this way. They got green coffee and they roasted it themselves at home because they knew it was the best. Once the commercial coffee roasters started, it was very hard for them to convince people that. They should roast the coffee. It'll be much more convenient, and they could just deliver the coffee. Because people were used to having the higher quality of the coffee. The commercial coffee roasters almost all went out of business. It took them 10 years to catch on and for people to start saying, okay, you can roast my coffee and deliver it. They were probably delivering it very fresh uh, in those days. But then what happened is uh, in... Early 20th century, with the with uh, World War One, they wanted to be able to boost the energy of the soldiers. What a great idea! Let's make coffee, package it, send it to them over there, and they can make coffee before they go into battle because it will it will help. And uh, so during that time, what was happening is people were inventing processes that allowed them to roast, grind, and then vacuum pack in cans, uh, later in plastic bags, but initially in cans, plastic uh, um, uh, packages coffee and send it overseas. And that's how the convenience aspect took over of uh, the quality aspect. And around yeah. that time also, you had all these advantages. You had the Italians. They, they were focusing on the machinery. How do we get the, mo the most intense extraction possible? Made an incredible job being able to do that. The Italian espresso machines, in my opinion today, are the best ways to get the most potent coffee possible, right? But um, um, the convenience factor and the idea of in the 50s and 60s and 70s, my parents grew up, instant coffee. That's all we had in the house, instant coffee. We didn't even brew our own coffee. It's easy. Put a teaspoon in a cup, add hot water, you're done. Yeah, really easy, but the coffee terrible. I mean, it tastes terrible and it gives you just caffeine because it's all robusta, right? So um, what what 
in a sense, what I'm promoting is let's go back to the indigenous culture. Let's do it the way they did it. But let's do it with today's machinery that will allow us to do it in a much more efficient way. And so we have that balance between that very high quality and also the convenience of doing it fairly quickly. Because we don't want to sit there for four, three, four hours in an Ethiopian coffee ceremony every day. They do in Ethiopia, they have the time to do it, but let's say we don't have the time to do it in our own home. So let's collapse that time, 10, 15 minutes, just take that time by yourself in the morning, be able to make the coffee in this way. It becomes a ritual, it becomes an experience, and that can really uh, set the focus and intention of the whole day. And it really uh, is magical like that. I came up with some meditation with the coffee that you have with the coffee in order to, um, to structure, in order to uh, make your focus uh, what you want to create during every day. And I think that's uh, it's really helpful. And in that way, I'm back to making coffee a performance enhancing drug and being able to construct our thoughts and ideas, our inspiration and our creativity in daily life. Yeah, I think, like you said, I think in the 50s and 60s, the 60s, convenience was king uh they started coming out with everything instant you know microwaves and instant food and instant coffee and everything is ready okay. in a second and that was kind of the ethos for the last i don't know 40 50 60 years and i think now we're gradually seeing movements in coffee as well but obviously in food and other areas where uh, no, it's, you know, the the instant that you can get and then put it in the microwave and it's ready within a minute. That's not what's going to nourish your, your body or your soul. You know, getting, going to the garden, getting your, your fresh veggies, organic, putting them, uh, you know, cutting them up, chopping them, making the food, cooking it over a fire, like all that stuff that takes more time is actually what tastes better and what's more nutritious. And I think there's a movement, like you said, in coffee, but I also see this in, in food and other areas um, where people are just tired of, of stuff that I don't want to say tastes like plastic, but just doesn't taste, um, doesn't have the full potential of what it can taste like. So I think there's definitely a movement in that direction. Huge movement, 100%, 100% agree. And, and the movement is with the young people, too. Because the young yeah. people, they get it. They see right through the corporate BS, you know? They, they really understand it. And they're getting back more to living in a natural way. Whereas older people, even my generation, you know, are just, uh, accept what they've been told, what they've been taught. They don't look any further. They don't want to have to think about it. And they just kind of go through, uh, the motions of life. Whereas the younger people, they're alive, they're vibrant, they're coming up with new ideas, creativity, and, and that's the market that I think is going to uh, drive us forward. And it really has been driving the movement of uh, this fresh roasted uh, coffee, which is still pretty much in its infancy. Yeah. So as far as the, the growing aspect, I know a lot of coffee beans are, you know, steeped in, in pesticides, herbicides, and sexicides, you know, synthetic fertilizers, all, all the, all the, all the bad stuff. Um, and they also consume massive amounts of water. Are there better, more organic ways of, of growing them that maybe some people have started to, to do? Yes, there are. Um, uh, so what you're referring to with, with, uh, first of all, the, the coffee that, uh, I use, all organically grown. I mean, it's not certified mm -hmm. organic because the certification process is a scam in itself. Um, yeah, it costs but, a lot of money. Yeah. And I know the farmers, so I know the process of, uh, of growing it organically without using pesticides, which is actually uh, better for, I mean, everything. The pesticides in the coffee don't even work that well. And they killed the trees after several years. That's what my partner found out. He said that uh, the, the people who could afford the pesticides were the ones whose trees were dead in five years. Whereas, uh, wow. when he didn't use it, he didn't have that problem at all. Um, but, uh, there is a way of growing it and it's called dry process. Now, dry process is the processing of the coffee 
after harvesting and just letting it dry out in the sun. Because what happens with the wet process, the semi-wet process, coffee is washed in water. There's huge, tremendous amounts of water that's being used. And that doesn't have to be the case. And in fact, the dry process coffee is different in that the cherries are allowed to dry and all of the substances in the cherries get soaked up, gets absorbed by the seed, which is the coffee uh, bean. It's actually a seed of the coffee cherry. Yep. Now, that seed, when it's dry processed, it's going to have much higher antioxidants. It's going to have much higher um, uh, vitamins and minerals that are beneficial for the body because it's been soaking up everything that that cherry has. The other way of processing, the wet process, is when they pick the cherries and they immediately put it through machines and separate the fruit and the cherries and then dry, uh, I mean, separate the uh, seeds and the fruit and then they dry the seed. So that process is going to have a uh, much lower antioxidant. But uh, you can get a more consistent coffee that way because there's another process within that process that uh, uh, does a sorting. Um, it's a, uh, a way to sort the coffee so that you have more consistency of uh, the size and quality of the beans. And the way that sorting is done is they take the cherries and they throw them in the water. And every cherry that floats on the surface, they take them out and separate them. They don't use them. Mm. Only, they only use the ones that sink to the bottom because uh, apparently that is the more intense seeds are causing that uh, cherry to sink to the bottom. And those are the better ones. So if you have a seed that's not fully developed, that's broken or something, the cherry floats in the top. Okay, they take those out. They don't even use. So that's the process with the wet process. Whereas the dry process, you just pick all of them and you dry all of them together. So you're not getting the sorting benefit of those ones floating on the water, right? But you're yeah. getting a much higher antioxidant um, effect with the dried cherries, and it's not using nearly as much water. So I think you're gonna start seeing more and more coffee uh, being um, produced this way, more and more dry process, because it's, it's easier, more environmentally friendly, and in the end, it, it gives a uh, higher level of uh, antioxidants. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, again, that's uh, also something that I think we're seeing a movement uh, of more sustainable or as sustainable as possible, at least more organic, um, less mass productions, uh, more local, more uh, small batch. So I think we're, you know, that's definitely also a movement. Um, do you think? Do you think your philosophy for coffee is true for other foods as well? So if you're saying for coffee after a week. It's essentially dead. Uh, you're not getting all the, the nutrients, the flavors, the, the benefits. Could that be for other potentially fruits, veggies, uh, legumes, I don't know, other foods that we're consuming in the supermarket that we're just not getting the full potential of it? Without question, definitely. That's a very good, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, absolutely. I totally agree. Um, let's, let's take tea, right? What are mm -hmm. we used to having with tea? Like Lipton tea from the store shelf? You know, what are, the, what are the really active ingredients to tea? You know, there's really quite a few. The Chinese tea ceremony and the kind of tea they use in China and specialty places in Japan, completely different tea than what we're used to. Yeah. So if you have those fresh leaves and you have, you know, you know what those chemical content is from that hand picked tea and then it's Treated in a certain way, not just put through a big factory where it's stripped out of all its uh, benefit of uh, all its uh, chemical benefits. Uh, then um, you know it's a, it's a different experience, and I think we should start looking at all food that way, because I'm sure that that is the case for thousands of different kinds of food, but 
we haven't looked into it because there's been a big business behind it that just wants yeah. us to buy conveniently what's in the store, what's on the store shelf, what's on sale, and we go put it in a bag, bring it home, put it in the refrigerator, we're done. You know, we don't have to go through the process of farming it, of uh, processing, harvesting, that kind of thing. You know, but I think yeah. for sure, for sure, there um, are uh, those differences uh, for so many different uh, foods. I pretty much uh, eat a, a raw food diet, uh, fruit and leafy greens, because oh, wow. uh, I, I've come to understand that that is a species specific diet. So there's a lot of information coming out about cooking food and how that creates a synergy. <clears throat> and uh, how as a species, if we're living in a tropical area and just eating fresh fruit from the tree, that that is the best and the most beneficial uh, for our body. So by living in Bali and experimenting on myself, I had an opportunity to come to uh, a lot of conclusions Reasons like that. Um, and the only thing that I don't eat that is really not raw and cooked is coffee because it's roasted. But with seeds, you either have to, with seeds and nuts, you either have to sprout them or roast them in order for our bodies to assimilate them, assimilate the vitamins and minerals in them. We just pick up a seed and eat the seed. That seed is going to slide through our digestive system because it wants to be a tree. Our digestive system isn't able to break that seed down and use the nutrients and then expel the rest. The whole seed yes. is going to come out because that seed is designed to not be broken down by the human body. So that's why we have to do something, uh, process in some way seeds and nuts in order to get the benefits from them. And I just think coffee is a, a very unique uh, seed uh, in that way because uh, when you roast it and you're using it fresh, there's, there's all these chemical substances that aren't found in other other seeds and other fruits that's uh, really very powerful. You have cacao, cacao seeds, and that's uh, quite different. It's uh, a little bit different buzz, but it's still pretty powerful. But the, the yeah. whole chocolate business has, uh, you know, uh, come up and evolved around that in a similar way that it has around coffee too, right? I mean, you have Percy's chocolate, you have chocolate flavor, you have all this stuff that's uh, come out to be, and it doesn't have the same kind of nutrients as the actual cacao seeds that are uh, roasted, uh, and they roast at a much lower temperature, but that uh, once they're roasted, that we can take in and get the benefits. Have you ever seen there's a video where um I forget what channel it is, but they go to either Cote d'Ivoire or Sierra Leone, where the majority of, of cacao is grown in the world, and they give these chocolate farmers chocolate, like from Switzerland, and these guys taste chocolate for the first time in their life. They're like they didn't even know what it was. They're like, Well, what is this? And they're like, This is what you're growing, this is chocolate. And they taste it and they absolutely loved it. They finished like four or five bars um and they it was just so funny to see and these these guys were old these are not like kids you know they must have been in their I don't know, 60s whatever but and they've been doing this their whole lives never tasted chocolate so that was a i, I thought that was a fascinating video yeah so but I, I would love to try what they're making so let's say yeah. they take home yeah. some of their props what are they doing with it? They've been working with it for so long that they're not adding nearly as much sugar, I'm sure, right? And then they're processing it and probably using it in such a way that it tastes completely different to this. this uh, sweet they're probably oil. making something completely different from it. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. that, I bet that would be really interesting and really good to, uh, to explore. Yeah, because for the most part, that'll go to Europe, you know, Belgium, Switzerland, whatever, and they'll just add a lot of dairy, a lot of sugar, a lot of, uh, exactly. I don't know, vanilla yeah. or, or these different flavors. And at the end, like, I doubt you're really tasting anything that's remotely close to what cacao tastes like, unless maybe you get like 
those 100 percent you know bitter chocolates which maybe those are a little bit closer to what it is but the most chocolate that people eat is it's not really chocolate it's, it's just it's dairy and, and sugar right yep exactly exactly and that's uh, like the uh, uh, starbucks right it's it's yeah. uh milk flavored coffee yeah i mean i mean coffee i mean coffee flavored milk drink right yeah yeah it's definitely what it is so i mean you're you're very outspoken and you've been very critical of the the coffee industry have you seen or received any any pushback or negative feedback uh from people about your opinion uh, uh i i received a lot of um i mean a lot of haters there's a lot of people who <laughs> they're me. always there they're always there right but uh nothing no pushback yet from like big companies just because i'm not big enough yet but i think if i get uh once they get to a level or become a threat, then um, I expect there to be pushback for sure. But hopefully by that, and, and that's why this is such a, uh, this has to be done on such a grassroots level and why I'm starting at a grassroots level. I need to build a foundation. I can't go right to the top and start spouting these ideas without being completely knocked off. But if, if I'm... Uh, doing this on a grassroots level and allowing everyone to experience that. And then they become yeah. totally knowing that they are rock solid in their understanding and agreement with me. That's what will build the foundation. And that's uh, what I am planning on growing with. So I know I need to, to get this, uh, the word out, get people to try it and understand uh, the ideas behind it. And then it just makes logical sense. This isn't far out there. This is just logical sense based on thousands of years, the thousand years of experience, you know? Um, yeah. And, and, and that's what I see really us doing. We have to go back to the indigenous cultures. And how are they using these this material coming out of the earth? These plants, these fruits, vegetables, leaves, you know, how are they using it uh, to benefit uh, the human body? Because right now we have huge incidences of diabetes and obesity and everyone everyone eating processed foods. It's a processed lifestyle. And that's part of what I am promoting is getting away from that and going back to nature, going back to the source, going back to what's real, what's true, and, and aligning with that. And then I think we can really reverse the, the physical a problem that uh, so many people are suffering from today. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm a convert already, man. I'm already, uh, I've already thinking about things differently as far as coffee. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I was glad to to have you on today uh, to talk about all these different things, man. I really appreciate it. Maybe you can kind of talk about uh, your book, The Fourth Wave of Fresh Roasting Revolution. Uh, so people uh, yeah. maybe can try and find it and, you know, get to know a little bit what what's it about. Yeah, so uh, I I wrote this book um, a couple of years ago and self-published it. because I just wanted to get my experience and my ideas out there. It's not a long book. It's only about 65 pages, but it goes through the, my history of understanding uh, what coffee is about. My experience kind of paralleling the experience of the coffee industry from, from wave one, two, three. And now what I'm calling a uh, wave four. Uh, so it's, um, easy, easy read. And I think easier understanding of my point of view, and how I've come to the conclusions that I've come to. Uh, so the book is self published. You can, people can find it on lulu.com, l-u-l-u.com. Title of the book is Coffee, the fourth wave of fresh roasting revolution by Asher Yaron, A-S-H-E-R. My last name is spelled Y-A-R-O-N. And, um, yeah, I believe, uh, so if you order through Lulu, actually, you get 40% discount. On Amazon, nice. its price is, uh, is, is much higher. So, um, uh, um, I, I also have a website that I've created, like a blog. It's called coffeetruther.com. www.coffeetruther.com. And on that, I, I have a lot of articles. I have videos. I've created a YouTube channel called Coffee University where I have about, uh, I think now about uh, 60 or 70 videos that I've created about all different wow. aspects of coffee um, and, and mostly short talks. So it's, it's 
they're usually from two to ten minutes long, so it's very easy to uh, to go through um, to see all the different uh, subjects. But pretty much comes down to the same ideas of fresh roasting and using fresh roasted coffee. But I also discussed about different brewing practices, grinding methods, that kind of thing. So um, people can go to YouTube and look up Coffee University, or they can go to my uh, coffeetruther.com uh, channel and uh, get the link from there. But uh, I'm yeah, going to so continue on this process. I see this as a lifelong journey. I want to get the word out. And um, once my uh, power roaster is finished, we're, we're working on the second generation. And it's, it's been upgraded quite a bit. And we'll do a Kickstarter campaign uh, when that prototype is finished in two to three months and immediately go into production. I, I hope to be in full production of my uh, power roaster by the end of the year. And then work on the grinder and then a proprietary uh, manual expression. So I'm really excited to do uh, to do all of these things, to create the equipment so people can have the best coffee, affordable, um, and have uh, have that in their home, not have to leave their home to go out to get it. You heard it here, people. Go check out all those sites, all those links. Me, I'm already personally a convert. Once those, you know, once you're ready and you're in production, let me know. I'm definitely interested. And yeah, man, I, again, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. I learned a hell of a lot today and I'll definitely start uh, adjusting the way I consume coffee based on what we talked. And uh, yeah, man, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. That's great. You know, it, it starts with an awareness. That's all I'm saying. Find the awareness that I'm saying, hey, you know, don't believe everything I'm saying, but start to look into it. Start yeah. to ask questions. Start to be more observant about what you're doing because we tend to go through these routines that we've developed over years and we do it um, unconsciously. What I'm trying to do is say, let's be more conscious. Let's be more aware. Let's see what's going on. Let's experience it for ourselves. That's really the my message here. Is hey, check this out. This is amazing. See what you think. Not like hey, buy this product and and this is what you'll get. I don't care. Yeah. I really don't. I just want to get my message out that says, you know, let's start thinking differently, and let's start exploring the world in a different way because what I found out is there's a lot to explore because. There's a lot of stuff out there that's been uh, been uh, programmed for us to believe a certain thing about it. You know, the pharmaceutical medical industry, I mean, that's a really good example of that, right? So when you mm -hmm. start to ask questions like, okay, why are we doing this? And what are the benefits? And where are the studies and stuff like that? That's where I think uh, we need to be. And, and, and people are starting to go through that process and that's really very exciting we're starting to ask those questions all right man so definitely again appreciate your time uh, i think uh this has been a great podcast and uh yeah let us know once everything drops and uh we'll definitely be in touch absolutely thanks roy uh it's been uh right. been a pleasure uh talking thanks so much man